welcome to part 2 of episode 15 of series 2 interview with Patrick Murphy from the Irish South and West. Patrick, you've also been working with this uh, group, uh, Seafood ORE. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Well, at these meetings we, we, we put in that um, in the terms of reference, uh, there was a lot more to be added to them. Unfortunately, we didn't get our way, but they are on the record. And um, we wanted engagement from countries outside of Ireland. We wanted to um, ensure people to be spoken about when people come into the areas and, and whatever work is going on to be. We wanted um, this is the, the stocks uh, the, where they spawn to be absolutely given paramount protection, spawning grounds and everything. And um, we're working to this. Um, and Captain Robert McCabe is the chairperson. We had a very positive meeting the last one, but it was a bit tough up until then. To be honest with you, we were we were working very hard for it, you know. But um, this is this is of critical importance, Oliver, because 90% of the waters in the, the Irish Sea has been um, applied for for offshore wind development. So 90%, I guess 10% for fisheries. Now <laughs> that 10%, uh, I believe, is more or less channels in and out. Uh, so there's no fishing there either, you know. So this is this is a, a serious implications for fishing industry. And, um, you know, we have to get this right. We do need uh, other sources of, of energy. I think the cost of it is outrageous, to be honest with you. I, I think when the Irish people see how much their electricity bill will go up from this, there mightn't be such an appetite to stick them onto the sea. There's plenty of places on the land. We've uninhabited islands all around the coastline. <laughs> There's your foundation and everything else. Way easier. Why aren't they being put there? Like, you know, if they're uninhabited, do a deal with the island owners. I'm sure they'd be delighted with getting a few bob for an uninhabited island. And I'm speaking as one of the people whose family have one of these that, that has an island off here island and you easily could put a wind farm up there and, in, and interfere with nobody and run a cable in without interfering with, with fishing grounds and everything else and taking the risk of doing untold damage that we don't even know what it'll do into the, into the decades ahead. But look, the, the Seafood RE group is an important group that's there. Um, we're going to see if the report meets what we want in the end of it and see where it goes. But um, it's it's definitely uh, something that needs to be watched. Well, we've seen Ursula von der Leyen. She was speaking in, in the dial today and she has basically said Irish waters are great. We're going to plant as many offshore wind farms in them because Ireland's become going to become the generating hub for for Europe. Green Island. Even though you're far away from Russia and Ukraine, you are making an essential contribution to overcoming our energy crisis. Ireland is a wind energy superpower and a key player in our European Green Deal. Last year, 31% of Ireland's electricity came from wind turbines a share only topped by Denmark. And you are now doubling down on your commitments. Your landmark Climate Act of 2021 set the ambitious goals to cut emissions by 51% by 2030 and to increase your renewable share up to 80%. This is good for Ireland and this is good for Europe because you can become a net exporter of energy and help the rest of Europe replace Russian fossil fuel. The new electricity interconnector to France, supported by European funds, will become yet another engine of growth here in Ireland. And that's, uh, that's pretty concerning con considering that we're still looking at the science behind the, the effects of uh, and impacts of offshore wind farms. Do you know what a statement like that now would just bring you back to the likes of the matrix with Kenny Reeves where they plug the, the human being into the power plant. We are now that power plant, but like the fishermen are the ones that are, are, are being plugged into. This has huge consequences for the Irish fishing industry. And to be honest with you, not just us, the other fleets that are coming over here. We've the richest grounds in Europe, uh, not just for fishing, but for spawning and and the creation of new life. We had this at the start of the interview about the blue whiting. 
for somebody to come in here and say, listen, it's more important to put up a wind turbine into the sea rather than putting it on the land, right? And um, that's the way to go. And and regardless of, of, of the consequences that may be there, we don't know, but sure, it'll be fine. That That's not good enough. But look, this is indicative of uh, the European Union's hypocrisy. Like, you know, you, you know, my involvement with the Russians to keep them out. And so I, I'm, I'm balanced. Nobody can be saying that I'm pro Putin or anything else, but for the European Union to come in and throw wind farms all over the place rather than firing missiles up into the air. It's the same concerns we have and they're dismissing our concerns. At least the Russians moved out into deeper water, but uh, this seems to be a done deal and I'll explain why. Ireland will reach its requirements for, for um, power at seven gigabytes, right? From the ocean, that's what they've said. Seven gigabytes will be enough, yet they want to put 30 there. And they know that putting wind farms into the sea will discommode fishermen. Yet it doesn't matter to these people. Our rights don't exist. So just because we're a small minority and an indigenous people around the coastline doesn't mean we don't have rights. Yet they seem to be able to think it's OK to trample all over them, you know, and, and if this is what the European Union is standing for, they should keep their gobs shut when they're talking about international incidents, incidents for other countries. They are no ones to talk is the saying, you know. So for that lady to come over here and to say that, to be honest with you, it just shows, you know, the, the true intent of the European Union and the true hypocrisy, uh, you know, it's uh, say what I want you to, to, what I want to say, you listen to me and only me and, uh, you know, I'm right, you're wrong and it doesn't matter if I contradict myself in different areas, I'm always going to be right. And um, it's just a pity that at this moment we have a minority government that seems to go along with this. Which brings us, Patrick, on to along to the next topic, which was the event in uh, Cork recently, the European Union's mission to protect and restore ocean and inland waters in the Atlantic and the Ar Arctic regions by 2030. So it nearly seems like a contradiction in terms when they're talking about increasing wind power, offshore wind power, and then they're talking about restoring the seas and they seem to think that they can do both. Yeah, but like here's an organization that wants to see if we can do both. We we did a presentation there. We got to speak at it. And as I said, if you're going to restore the oceans, then the first people you talk to are the fishermen, right? The custodians of the sea, as Savignia said, uh, when we did fight off the Russians, you know, when we when we when we stood firm and if he believed that missiles firing up into the air was going to damage our ocean, then the amount of noise and, and the disturbance to the bottom and everything that these wind farms in is of course going to have an impact. We won't know the long term impact on that, but restoring our oceans, like, you know, as you said, of course, it's a contradiction. But if we could work with them, if we could see and at least go slowly, you know, see what's coming in and see how that much like it's it, there's no way we're going to stop um, wind farms going into the sea, it, 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 it literally. Um, it, it would take confrontation, I, I believe so. But the minimum that should be there, uh, Oliver, is that anybody that's being discommoded or losing the farm, like in any other walk of life, gets compensated and not just for the year or the day or the week, you know, but for life and for the next generation. So we need to keep fishing going. There's no doubts about that. But, you know, we hear about the cap, right? Uh, and you hear about uh, all the money that goes into farmers and people complaining, you're subsidizing food and everything else. Well, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. You know, if we need to get cheap food and, and keep people fed, you know, uh, um, then there's a reason for that. Either that or you're going to be paying an awful lot of more money for food because it will cost more to produce it when the costs go up, the people producing it get to carry those costs. So if they can't pass it on to the consumer, somebody else has to come in. Otherwise, there, there won't be production. It's the same for fishing boats. You you hear about us on about the fuel and everything else um, and on about our minister. And why, why aren't we getting the fuel, fuel subsidies the same as the our colleagues from France and Spain and Denmark and other places? Now they're all seeing some money being given to them for the fuel. We were told to tie up to the pier wall and that's your subsidy. That only covers the people that tie up to the pier wall. It doesn't cover the people that go to sea or agriculture or the processing factories or anybody else who's had in the industry that suffered from rising fuel costs. So, you know, it, it's it's not the brush that fits all. But this conference, back to that, 
yeah, um, we spoke at it because it was really important to put the industry aside at that conference and to speak for our fishing communities uh, all around the coastline. Like, and we got the message across. Um, I was uh, expected, and I, I did manage as close as I could to get my um, presentation across in five minutes or less, um, which I did. I, I, I got everything in, not in detail, and people complimented me on on the presentation because I gave the truth. I, I explained what was at stake here and the amount of effort and we showed up the biologically sensitive areas and what was being asked of us and, and people saw, I hope for the first time and not the last, what we're talking about here and, and the amount of waters that everybody wants to get from the fishermen and not consider the fishermen. And that's what it is because our industry has fished these seas for generations and generations, you know, and, and back to O'Sullivan Bear, where you put a chain across the, the mouth of the harbour to charge the Spanish to come in and salt the fish and whatever else to treat the fish. So this is going back for, as I said, hundreds of years and for somebody else to come in and say, well, it's all right, now you can move off. And then at the same time, blacken us as the people that are destroying the sea. Like we had BIM there and Catherine Barris, and she said 900 tons of plastic has been removed from the sea by fishermen. 900 tons. Now, I don't know any other county council can, that can put up their hands and say, well, we've taken 100 tons out of the sea anywhere around the countryside. So there is only one people that can do this and take this rubbish out. And that's us. And we're the ones tasked at this. So like to take us out of the equation, it, it, it doesn't bear um, common sense. It, it's just madness, to be honest with you. So we, we said this at the conference and we got a good hearing about it. And I think it kind of opened people's minds and 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 reset the dial a small bit like that gave the fishermen and anybody I spoke to and Caduceus uh, 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 Seduscus uh, was the um, if I pronouncing his name right was one of the um, assistant directors from DG Mara and to be honest with you I had good conversations afterwards in the networking of X and, and John Bell and we had Ark up there from BIM showing the importance to kids of what industry uh, around the coastlines can generate in the food. And this is what we need to do. We need to re-educate the future generations and to dispel the bad language and use the, the realities and the truth that's there for fisheries. And that is, there is no um, a massive overfishing going on. We fish to the quotas and we change the quotas. If there's a stock that's gone down in numbers, we reduce our effort in that stock. You know, we farm the seas. We take what's plentiful and we leave the rest, you know, and it's it's a continuous cycle. And that's the same as taking apples off a tree or, or uh, growing carrots in the ground. That's nature. That's us. And, you know, it, it's how we live. And unless somebody can find something else for the human race to survive on, that's what we've been doing. And, and we're getting better at it. We're looking after the food chain um, better. It should be more distributed and better distributed across the continent and the world. There should be no need for hunger, you know, but you can't destroy the people who are risking all to go out there and catch this fish and trying to make a living out of it to support their family. You can't keep putting the load on their heads. That's very true. Like, you know, people tend to forget that if there was no fishing industry there, where is the fish going to come from? They'll go, oh, we'll get from fish farms, but fish farms are even fed on fish that's caught in the sea it's 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 one of those circles where you know you go it's it has to be looked after but, but if it's looked after it provides if it provides then it's a, a very valuable yes, asset and, and, and you hear people giving out that fish is being fed to fish and it's you know it's crazy that it should be fed to humans like which are if you look at animals right animals are fed food they're not fed fresh air you know so that food, you could have the same argument. Why are you feeding the food to the pigs and the sheep and the cattle and everything else? Why don't you give that to the humans? You know, this is the way it operates. This is farming. This is fishing. This is what it is for rearing food. The right thing is to make sure the animals and the fish and everything else are well treated and that you get good quality food into the, 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 the system so that people can eat good, healthy food, live longer lives, more productive lives, healthier lives. You know, this is what it's about. But it seems to be lost that fishermen now are the ones that are no longer given that accreditation. They're given it worse. Or, as you said in the report, we need to hammer this, we need to hammer that. These people, if they're given an inch, they'll take 100 miles. You know, that's not true. That's not true. All these people I know and fishermen, 
They want to make a living. They want to go out and make enough money to pay their crews and to be able to keep their boat right and get something for it. Now, as I said, people are at sea for maybe 25 days in the month. You know, they're doing it because they love it. Like nobody would do that. And to say, oh, they're going to rate the seas. They want to be rich. What? To be rich for four or five days that they can't even spend it because they're out in the sea. Like, you know, it's not like they have mattresses in, in the boat stuff with cash to say I'm richer than the next one. It, it doesn't work that way. You know, these people are ordinary family people. And yes, of course, there's some capitals and in, captains in industry that strive and build factories and stuff like that. But they, again, need to be applauded. You know, they're the ones that get up and go. They're the ones that put the fish in the fridge. The Agrifish Council is coming up uh, soon. And Ireland's going to see another round of cuts and the quotas. How's it going to affect your members? Which are any cuts is more pressure. You know, um, we try and speak with the scientists and, and say like that the regulations that govern the fishing sometimes isn't right, right. And then we get accused that, oh, you're trying to overfish and everything else. So I'll, I'll just give one example. We, I um, participated in the, in the Pelagic Advisory Council and one of the stocks that we seen because of the science that was coming up was going to be in danger. And one year there was massive increase given to Sked Mac and we're saying, oh, that's, that doesn't sound right, like, but sure, they gave it out anyway. We didn't catch all the Sked that was given out, right? But then the science turns and it says, oh, no, the stock is in trouble. And uh, because the stock won't recover to the previous levels in one year that the 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 the, the BLIM, right, the um, biomass limit um, won't recover in one year to what we see it as sustainable, then there should be zero tech, right? Now, to the ordinary person listening to this, the biomass, the size of the stock, is, and I'm going to say this slowly, 805,000 tonnes. Now, when a scientist or anybody else on the planet says to me, you cannot take one kilo of fish out of 805,000 tonnes because you'll damage it, isn't in the same reality as me. That makes absolutely no sense. I don't care about the year classes or whatever else. That is ridiculous. That means that the fish <laughs> are so slow in, in, in recovering, they should be dead an awful long time ago. The model can't be right. It, it's it just wrong. Now, even going with the model, we worked out that if you took a, a, a rebuilding plan into place and kept some sort of a fishery, so you dropped it 70% and, and you said you took 14 or 15,000 tonnes, the stock would, would would still be recovering, but not in such a rate that it would recover in a year, right? It would recover in maybe two or three years, right? Me, I think it would recover in a year. It just needs the science to catch up because fish don't have one offspring, right? They're not whales. They have thousands and thousands of eggs, you know? So like any two or three years and any stock should replenish itself given half a chance. And we just, we see that with spur dogs. We have a, We've we've spur dogs now everywhere around the coastline, and yet we've no quota for them. They're still a protected species, and you're just going. This makes no sense because fishermen do the right things, right? They stay away from fish, or they change their method of fishing. The stock recovers, and they still don't get to catch more fish. So you're you're not uh, uh, trying to entice people to follow the rules, then are you? So we have hake as another example. So for the last, since 2018 and 19, the stock has been said, oh, it's in decline, the retrospective bias to the stock, or there's more being caught, and we think it's not being properly recorded. That's my understanding of it, right? Or it's slack in some areas and it's not there. And then they do a new evaluation uh, in last year. And oh, the model is saying something entirely different. The biomass of the stock is now 71% bigger, right? Than we thought it was. But like that didn't happen just because they put it into the model. That's been the case for a number of years, which means that the advice they were given and, and the parameters that they set the advice in was obviously wrong for the last number of years, right? But still in all, they made the cuts, right? But <laughs> this is where I laugh. Instead of giving back the fish just that they took off last year, 23% cut, 
they're going to reverse it so that um, they're going to give an 11 11 to balance uh, what was not taken off the 23. So I'll have to explain this now to the to, to the people listening to this. Um, your head will be done in for this, lads, right? So last year we got to the December Council. We tell the minister, listen, that's too much of a cut. It's crazy. The science is obviously wrong, right? And the ministers, they listen to us. They look at the um, the advice and they say, look, they're giving the lower range. So there's a bit of flexibility here. We won't cut it 23 percent. We'll cut it 12 uh, percent, right? So what happens then next year? We were proven, right? 71 percent increase in the biomass, way more fish than we ever thought there was there. Uh, and what's the advice? 14 or 15 percent increase. But on, on last year's advice, so they still retain the idea that last year's advice was correct and that the ministers were wrong to only cut it <laughs> the 12 percent instead of the 23. You see, you're shaking your head. This is the madness of it. So they're giving a 15 percent increase, but on last year's advice. So when it boils down to it, it's only a 3 percent increase. This year, if they follow the advice, 3 percent. So remember now, the stock has gone up 71 percent. They've admitted to that, the biomass, yet an increase of 3 percent on last year's figures. Now, that makes no sense to me. The minimum it should be is a reversal of the cut last year. So it should be uh, at, uh, at least give back the full 12 percent, which would mean the advice should be a 23 percent increase reversal of the advice last year regardless. That's the minimum. That's just in last year's figures. But that isn't the case. And that's why we go to the minister and say, this is our viewpoint. You don't get much argument back from the scientists because they take the precautionary approach. Like, But it's very hard then for me and others then to take, see, you know, we need the proper science. We need the proper data. And you're just going, but sure, you have the proper data. You have the proper advice. And still yet and all, here we go. Like, we catch fish, Oliver. This is where it's complicated. We catch fish by weight, right? Not by numbers. So you catch one big fish, it's the same as catching three small fish. So it's better to catch the big fish, the scientists say, right? I have a slight bit of a faux pas with that because if you catch all the big fish under Darwin's theory, you the smaller fish might be the same age and you could be changing the genetics of the whole um, stock. But that, that's my own view. So I think it should be balanced. But anyway, so if you then have a year class increase, right, say in 2015, you'd, you'd a great recruitment. So year ones and they're coming into the fishery now, right? But they're the ones in the fishery, right? They're everywhere. So then when you say, well, because there's a poor year class in the other years, so we're not going to give you the catch rates, but you're catching the big fish. You're not catching the small fish. So you should still be allowed to catch the big fish if you catch my drift, but they caught it. So there's big fish everywhere. You're you're under the landing obligation. You can't avoid them. And if you catch them, then you're illegal. You're a IUU fishing. So you see, you have to take into consideration not just the modeling, but the realities, the knowledge of the fishermen to say, listen, yes, we agree with you. The biomass of the stock is down, but these massive big fish are there here now. We can catch them, you know, at a, a bit of quantity and see how, you know, take them out more food for the small fella. They'll come on, and as you said, there's there'll be better recruitment coming forward. But that doesn't seem to be taken in. That's why I prefer to hear the full environmental and assessment that other contributing factors. We have a massive increase in bluefin tuna. They should be fished. They're eating fish belong to us, and that's driving down our stocks. And somebody else is the benefit of them. But we're feeding them like. like this wouldn't happen in agriculture where a farmer opens the gate and he drives his cattle into the neighbor. He eats all the grass and he says, thank you very much. Leaves your man with no grass and takes his cattle to the market and sells them and gives your man a salute. That's not the way the world works, but it seems to be that way in fisheries, you know, and we're looking for balance in that and all these things to be addressed in, in the review of the common fishery policy. And this has been done in the past. So when you ask me about going to, to, to Brussels, these are all the arguments that we give to the minister and they're reasoned sound arguments. Unless somebody can tell me I'm wrong and explain to me where I'm wrong. I think these are reasoned arguments and there's just a key, a few key examples of, of what we do uh, right across all the species and try and explain that 
to the others to see the actual knowledge to the people is like, listen, before there was advice, what we did is we caught the more plentiful fish and stayed away from the ones that were got scarce. We targeted the more quantity. Now we're doing that with better advice. But when the advice then goes against the grain and says, well, there is loads of these fish, but you're still not allowed to catch them. You're scratching your head and you're going, but you're, it seems to be doom and gloom no matter what happens. We never seem to get the breaks. Now, this year, the porcupine is a welcome increase. We've done the hard work there. We've closed down the areas for months and stopped boats going out there. We actually only have a five month fishery outside in the porcupine. So it gives the stocks a chance to recover. The lads are using bigger mesh. They're not fishing, you know, they're catching the bigger prawns. You know, there, there's more than abundance of small ones on the ground and the population grows and that's good management of a fishery like. So that's working together. But imagine if they said, well, we looked in, you're not getting any more fish. So after all the pain, and that's where fishermen start to scratch their heads. You know, why should we keep doing what the scientists say and they're making promises when those promises are never realized? Yeah, it's like an over reliance on on science and, and not enough. Common or fishermen's knowledge being added into. Uh, creating the next year's fisheries. Yeah, look, at, like if you can put fishermen onto one type of fish that's more abundant, it takes the pressure off the other fish. That's natural. You know, fishermen are out there, as I said from the start, they're just the cut in that dictates everything, whatever they can put into the cut in and, and, and work. Like we have technical measures now to just expand on again more that happens in Brussels. So new technical measures are brought in. Like, and as I explained above in that show in Bob and Cork, we had uh, BIM had their net inside there. And I said, look, if you want to increase the size of the mesh, you can and all the fish will swim through it. But then there's nothing for the fisherman. So all he's doing is dragging a net around the seafloor. You know, and around the the the, the oceans, and um, and he's getting nothing for it, like because you know you're letting all the fish escape. But sure, they must the point. You don't get the fish, so it has to be in balance. It has to be thought out and reasoned. It has to be done slowly and step by step. And sometimes you might have to take two steps back, you know. But like you know, I had, I had these debates now with, with with all these people afterwards, as I said to you, you know, um, in the afters, and that's where a lot of conversations can be had one to one, very important to explain. And, I, and I'll give an example, right? And, and I'll do it here. Um, so you have the pen. And this is the net behind this, right? But that's trawling across the ocean behind me, if you can see it. Can you see me? And they told this way, a tree knots. And I said to them, get a mathematical equation to work out how much ground is covered. You see where the boats are? and work out exactly how much of the seabed is ever covered in the ocean. And I said, you would be surprised. It's very, very little. Whereas you're saying they're trawling everywhere. And the way I described it to them like this is this. Where fishermen fish are like roads in our countryside. They don't go into the fields. They trawl the same roads day in, day out, right? And they leave the rest of it alone. Very rarely they go outside. But if you take them off the roads, you're putting them into the, into the, into the grounds, into the the virgin fields, you'll tear the place up. That's when you start doing the damage. So like when they were talking about the VMEs, I said, your information was wrong. And I said, you can get a, a, a net, right? And, and watch what it does and get a video of it. You think that it scrapes everything off the bottom and tears it up. But sure, if that's the case, that's the same as pulling a plow behind you in a field with a car. You wouldn't get to the other end of the field. The plow would be full, full up with all the, the rubbish, the trees, the bushes. It's the same for a boat, like <laughs> they're not like spaceships. They can get blocked up like they, you know, so if the net fills up with anything but fish, they'll be an anchor to the seafloor. <laughs> it's not true. It skims across the top. And I said, look at the videos. And then I said, they said, well, well, what about the carbon coming up into the air? I said, did you ever have a snow globe? And I said, what happens when you shake the snow globe? What goes up must come down. It has to, because otherwise it wouldn't go to the bottom in the first place. And that's nature. But like, it's only when you have these conversations and explain it to them face to face and say, right, if I'm wrong, you explain it to me. Then there's silence. And then, you know, but like that gives them pause for thought. They have to go away. Now, as I said, there are other people that have to have these conversations and then you have people that just make up lies and mistruths and they've been in, they've a PhD or whatever behind their name and they use that then 
you know, and mistruths. Like one of the president presenters at, at this conference above said that there was five million tons of mussels taken from the Irish Sea. Like, and I'm just looking at her and saying, well, I'm not going to challenge that. No, that's just madness for somebody that not to be correct. Five million tons taken from the Irish Sea. Like, and then we realise what volumes of fish that is. That's nuts. Do you know? Never happened. You wouldn't even see five million mussels taken from something like that. A hundred mussels, a small ones makes a kilo, so you could make it out like it's just crazy stuff. But um, this is misinformation, and then that grabs the headlines, and the poor old fisherman then is the fellow that's blamed for doing all the eels and woes. And you know, we have that's our job is to try and tell the truth, and just like those interviews, and and speak to the other people in power and explain. Listen. This is the way it is, and if you don't believe us, come down and meet us, talk to us. We'll show you. There needs to be more of that done. Well, Patrick, it's it's very true. If there was five million tons of Irish mussels taken from the Irish Sea, I think there'd be um, a lot more happier-looking fishermen. <laughs> <laughs> that who eat them? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> five million. Tons like a tons. lot of muscles to be devoured, like you know. But yeah. then again, uh, you know, I, I I did speak about right across it. And we, we, that my presentation, Oliver covers a lot of things. It covers my own family businesses, my own involvement in the industry, and our own knowledge and what we've tried to do throughout the years to try and keep our fisheries going and and keep the seas going. And we have ideas. Fishermen are the most inventive. Um, courageous people going. You, nothing stops them. Do you know what I mean? And they've been developing and developing for the last number of decades. Like, and I was below in Baltimore at the launching of um, uh, the Sheehy's family's new boat and um, Ocean Crest. And um, it's amazing to see the technology that's on board the boat. Like, to be honest with you, I was impressed with the previous boats, but. I'm going into this one and I'm going, you'd nearly want to be a, a, a nuclear engineer to see the pipe work and everything that goes on and everything that's into how it all works. And you're just going, good God almighty. And that's to make everything more efficient, you know, to make things last longer, to make her more e easier, less on fuel and everything else. Like, you know, it's just make life easier for the crew. And it's just an amazing thing to see, you know, and um to think that we could lose it, yeah, it's frightening for the likes of me, to be honest with you. Well, Patrick, we'll leave it on that note, if that's OK with yourself. Uh, we've had a lot of information there today, and we'll have to get you back uh, after the uh, Agri-Fish Council, and we'll have a discussion of the outcome on that. Yeah, no problem. Um, look forward to it, Oliver, as always, and um, pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Patrick.